Welcome everyone to today's show of ProfoundStates.com. We're here with a special guest, Bonnie Jean Mitchell. She is uh, the founder of AlienAbductionHelp.com and a co-founder of AwakenVideo.org. She is a researcher, author, and a lifelong contactee. For over 20 years, she has given advice to those living through per paranormal and metaphysical experiences. She wrote the book Journey with the Star People in 2005, and she published her new book, The Shift, in 2021, and uh, Synchronicity with the Spiritual Shift and Ascension of Mankind. This latest book is the handbook for anyone who needs guidance through the, through the current paradigm shift in consciousness. Her phone number is, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, welcome to that show, Bonnie Jean Mitchell. Thank you, Mike. It's very good to be here. Uh, you are in Uruguay. I am. Yep. Uruguay, South America. Uh, I'm sure we could get into a long conversation about Uruguay. So if if you get old and senile, what will you still remember about Uruguay? What what is there oh, that's uh, is there a, a mountain range that's really pretty or what what besides the beaches and the water uh, in Uruguay? What else is is uh, notable about your country, the country you're living? In? Uh, well, I mean it's gorgeous. It's a natural beauty. I, we do have some mountains here. They're beautiful. I guess the biggest deal right here is that is the energy ley lines. There's a couple of castles that were built here on top of the ley lines. And they say that the the small mountains that are around here, it's like a ring of mountains right along the coast here. They say that they have very uh, magical properties, very energetic and they're, they're very old. And so apparently, uh, you know, hundreds of years ago, some people came and actually I think they were masons they came and they built castles on these ley lines so that's a, a really neat feature here and and there's a lot of um, farmland there's gauchos those are the cowboys and there's there's a lot of cattle and horses and sheep and uh, I mean it's a beautiful it's like a subtropical place we've got palm trees and parrots but at the same time it's you know, we've got regular uh, trees like pine trees and myrtle bushes and regular things that I'm used to uh, from back home. I came from Virginia, from the United States. And so there's a lot of the same, you know, plant life and birds and animals. So, so some of it's very familiar, but it's just beautiful. It's just very a uh, natural beauty. So are you familiar with, do you know what state in the United States was the first state to have cattle in the United States? Um, Virginia? Uh, Hawaii. Hawaii? No, I didn't know. Yeah, and, no. you know, you tell that to people and they won't, they won't, typically they won't believe you because, uh, because it's just kind of strange that the, that the, um, there we go, that the, uh, a state out in the middle of the ocean would get cattle before any other state in the union. Where uh, did they come from, the cattle? I don't know. They imported them from somewhere. I just huh. know uh, that they had them first. That's kind of one of those historical uh, anomalies. Hmm. So, so let's get back to you. So uh, what was the very first uh, odd experience in your lifetime, uh, the very first okay. one. The very first. Okay, it doesn't matter what kind back. of odd experience it is, just strange or odd or interesting. Okay. Well, I had a very interesting childhood. Um, I guess when I was three years old, I started using my third eye and projecting images into the dark. Um, yeah, my, my parents, they were very loving, kind parents, but I think they kind of had their hands full with me. Um, I had a lot of experiences and they tried to, to understand, God bless them. Um, but when I was three and four years old, I would, I would lay in the dark at night. Uh, my parents would come in and say goodnight to me and, um, 
they turn the light off. And so I'd be there in this dark room. Well, I've always been very psychic and I, I basically I have one foot in the physical world and one foot in the spirit world. And I can I can see and I can feel both places at the same time. So I'd lay there in the dark and I would keep my eyes open for as long as I could. And I just I'd focus like focus into the darkness to see what I what I could see. And so I started seeing images. And there was stuff like candy and toys and balloons and ice cream. And these were glowing images lit up very colorful. And they were like right in front of my forehead, like maybe two foot in front of my forehead, almost like I was viewing a screen. So I really think that I was doing that myself. And as I was doing that, about four years old, I started to see people walking into my room while I was still awake. And these were humans and they were very friendly. There were probably you know, great grandparents or someone from my family uh, coming to visit me and they'd walk up to the side of my bed and they they'd be smiling and happy and they would try to talk to me, but I could never hear them. I could see their lips moving, but it was literally like there was a plate of glass between us, like looking at them through a window and and we couldn't touch each other or hear each other. Uh, but I could see them. And so that happened for a while. And then when I was four years old, I saw the star people for the first time or aliens. I call them star people because probably, you know, in my early 20s, I saw them a lot and they usually came from the sky, like from the stars. So I call them star people. Um, so when I was four years old, I saw them for the first time it happened one night. I had been asleep, um, but I woke up during the night and I sat up in my bed and I saw these two beings walking toward the foot of my bed and they were holding hands, uh, which I guess was meant to, you know, show that they were friendly. And they had huge bulbous heads and tiny little stick bodies. I couldn't see their faces. I could only see that they were huge round heads. And I hadn't seen anything like that before and it, it scared me pretty good. So I screamed. Uh, my mother came running into the room and she, as she came in, they kind of became translucent and they just slowly faded from my view. And she sat down with me and I told her what happened. and. You know, she was very sweet. She was like, it's just a dream, honey. And so that's usually what she would tell me. And uh, so that was the first time I saw the star people. And then um, around the same time, I was uh, sleeping in bed with my mother one night. My dad was out on a hunting trip, I think. And so uh, I was laying there, you know, during the night with my mom. I woke up. And I started doing this thing with my third eye and I saw a little tea set. It was like a, a tea tray with a teapot and little cups. And I always wanted one of these so I could have tea with my dolls. So I'm pretty sure I was creating this with my third eye and it was in the air above me. It was all lit up. It was beautiful. And so I was laying there and I, I was trying to grab it, but I felt like, you know, no matter how hard I tried, it seemed like it was out of my reach. So I stood up in the bed and it still was always like, you know, too far for me to, to reach. And um, I started jumping up and down on the bed to reach it. And then I noticed that my hand went right through it. And my mom woke up, of course, and she watched me and she's like, Bonnie, what are you doing? I was like, Mommy, I'm trying to grab the tea set up there. Can't you see it? And she's like, what? And I I realized that she was actually starting to get a little scared. And so I stopped. I didn't want to scare her. And so I sat down and I tried to explain it to her, but she didn't, you know, she didn't understand what was happening. And she remembers that, you know, she, she recently passed last year. She passed in the spirit, but we've talked about it plenty of times. She remembered it very well. 
And uh, I wrote about it in my book, The Shift, and I drew a picture of it, of me and her in the bed. It's kind of funny to me. Um, so have you talked to her since she passed? I have, yeah. I have a great connection with her and my father who passed, you know, about 15 years ago. But yeah, I, I, I'm very fortunate. I do this thing uh, when somebody in my family is going to pass, they will come and see me in a dream about a year beforehand and they'll, and they'll tell me. So I know ahead of time and then I can tell other family members and they don't always take me seriously. They probably do now, but um, yeah, I always, I always know beforehand. And, and then after they pass, so far it's been four people in my family, so far they've done the same thing. After they pass, it seems like one month will go by. It's almost like they're resting for about a month and then then they'll come and see me in a dream so yes i i see my mom all the time now in spirit form yeah so what uh keep going forward to your next interesting experience okay want to, don't skip anything we want to hear it <laughs> i can't include everything we everything. Yeah, wouldn't be talking for 10 hours or more <laughs> <laughs> you want to hear it all Okay. Okay, let's see. The next one. Um, golly, there's many, but let's see. I'll go forward to when I was about seven. Um, so, so the first time I saw the star people, I was four and I was scared of them. But by the time I was seven, we were friends. And I'm really not sure how that developed because I don't have a good memory of that. But I do know that at seven years old, um, once again, at night, I was still doing the same thing. I'd lay in bed uh, before I fell asleep and it was dark. It had to be a dark room and I could do this third eye thing. And I had my dolls on a shelf in my room and there was enough light, just a little bit coming in the window. I could see the dolls on the shelf. And so one night I was using my third eye and I saw the dolls on my shelf start to move their eyes and their lips. And that really freaked me out. And I hid under my blankets for a minute. And then I, I kept peeking back out and they, they kept doing it. They basically came to life. And two of the dolls on my shelf, they stood up and stepped off of the shelf as they stepped down off the shelf they grew um to about three and a half foot, four foot tall or so and they turned into star people and so these these two star people were they were um, pretty light-skinned kind of a yellowish tannish kind of color and their their heads were pretty big and they did have big black eyes um, but I recognized them and I wasn't scared of them. And one of them walked up right to right to where my pillow was, right where my head was. And the other one stayed down by my feet at the foot of the bed. And I, I was like, oh, it's just my friends. And so I sat up, I was awake and I threw the blankets off and I hopped out of bed and the one on my left by my pillow uh, held my hand and then the other one from the foot of bed came up and held my other hand. And we walked right past my sleeping parents through the living room and out the front door. And um, unfortunately, I don't remember what happened after that. I, I think they wanted me to go somewhere with them. And I'm not sure where we went. But that was like, you know, I felt like, like I knew them and I was used to doing this already. And then another thing happened when I was seven, and this was a, a life changer for me. Um, so one night I was in bed uh, asleep and a little star person, a very short one, shorter than me, and I was seven years old, so he must have been tiny. He ran up to my bed and he was kind of in an urgent manner, he said, hurry hurry we've, we've got to hide we've got to hide and so I, I went with him I jumped out of bed and we we ran into the closet in the hallway 
and we got in there and we got behind some clothes and stuff and he was like be very quiet there's there's some bad men coming into the house and we had to be very quiet so i remember standing in the closet with him and looking down at him and uh i didn't say anything i was really quiet and we kept looking at each other and we heard uh some some men come in the front door and they were looking around the house and uh my my parents were just asleep through the whole thing this was in virginia that was in virginia okay, yeah go ahead. yeah oh, what, and so where in virginia this was in um southern virginia like the foot of the blue ridge mountains southern virginia yeah like yeah okay, southern go yeah go ahead. Um, so we were in the closet hiding and we listened carefully um these the men were in there like rummaging around or something and then we didn't hear them anymore and so we thought it was safe to go out and we carefully opened the closet door and, and walked out and we didn't we didn't hear anybody or see anybody so we walked out to the living room and he wanted me to go with him and we had to go outside to do that um, but we were a little concerned because of these bad men that might be out there um, but we didn't see anybody and we waited for a little while didn't see anything so we went out the front door <clears throat> and down the uh, front steps of the porch and then of course these two men come running around the side of the house and we kind of panicked me and my little friend and he went one way and I ran the other. I ran across the street to my neighbor's house because I I knew them very well. I had been at their house a lot. And so I ran over there and I went in their back door into their kitchen. And the two men were right behind me. And they came in the kitchen with me. And um, there was a like a round table in the kitchen and of course, I, being a little seven-year-old, thought I could just run around the, around the table and get away from them. And they just stood there and waited for me, you know, to come around the table. And this one man, uh, very mean, very meanly, stuck his foot out and tripped me on purpose. And I fell, like, flat on my face. And as I fell forward, he took a tiny little square, little piece of metal, like a little flat piece of shiny metal, and he stuck it on my lower rib on my left side as I fell. And uh, I remember just yelling. I remember screaming when he did that. And then the next thing I know, the scene changed. Uh, I had like blacked out. And when I became conscious again, I was in a room laying on a cold hard table, like a metal table and I was strapped down to it. And laying next to me was another table, and there was another girl there on this other table, and she was a lot older than me. She was probably about 18 or so. And she was also strapped down, and we, we were looking at each other. We were both scared. And uh, how, old were you, how old were you when this is occurring? Seven. Seven, okay, just making yeah. sure. All right, go, keep going. Yeah. And so uh, I remember the room pretty well. And um, I remember seeing, I remember looking up at these double doors that were metal doors, but they both had windows in them. And the windows had like a, kind of like a metal mesh inside, like a, like a cross hatch kind of mesh in the windows. And uh, these two double doors, metal doors. And um, there was, it was kind of like a landing when you came in the doors and there were two sets of stairs that came down. And so the tables that we were laying on were like down in this lower part on the lower floor. And I could look up and see the doors. And uh, the girl that was was there with me, this 18 year old, um, she was very kind to me. And she, you know, she knew that I was just a little girl and I was really scared. and. She tried to comfort me. It was really sweet of her. And uh, but we were both scared and some men came back into the room. And I don't quite remember if these were the same men that had chased me around the table um, or if they were different. 
but uh, they said to me in kind of a mean way, they said, we, we're going to coat you with gold and turn you into a statue. And I don't know what that was supposed to mean, but I, I took it, you know, literally. And I thought, I was going through this in my mind, I thought, what's going to happen to me? Well, you know, will I be able to breathe if they, <laughs> if they coat me with gold? Will I still be able to, am I going to die? You know, so I went through this, these things in my mind and nothing, nothing ever happened that I recall. Um, that was all that I really have a memory of. And I woke up from that. But I did go back to that place a number of times uh, throughout the years as a child. And I remember seeing other children there. And I also remember that there were nurses and a what I called a doctor. And I, I remember him. And um, <clears throat> they were usually dressed in like normal civilian clothing. Well, the nurses seemed to have like white, uh, you know, white robes on or whatever. But this doctor was always wearing like, you know, like a sweater and and just regular pants. Um, but he was he was white, a white man, and uh, he had black hair, and he actually had kind of like a goatee, like a black goatee. And he was kind of like overseeing this project, whatever was going on, and it had something to do with me and other children. Um, and I, I remembered him uh, and the nurses. So this interesting thing happened when I, when my parents took me to enroll me in public school, which tells me that I actually, I'm just, I'm just discovering this, Mike. <laughs> I must have seen that doctor and the nurses when I was much, much younger because my mother brought me to the public school. I was about four and a half, maybe I was almost five years old and I was pretty smart. I already knew the alphabet and I could, I could count pretty high and I could write my name and all of this. So when I got to the school, they told me that I could either go to kindergarten or I could go to first grade if I wanted to, but they left, totally left it up to me. And I said, I wanted to go to kindergarten. And the reason was because I had heard somebody saying um, something about nursery school. And I thought the kindergarten was nursery school and that there would be nurses there. And I remembered the nurses from this place where I went and they were always nice to me. You know, I wasn't afraid of them. And so I thought, well, I'll go to kindergarten. I'll get to see the nurses will be there. And I remember going to kindergarten and they, they were never showed up and I was very disappointed. So that's interesting. <laughs> but um, I actually went back to that place where the doctor was when I was uh, quite a bit older. I was probably in my 20s probably 25 or older when I went back there I, I went back there to visit and um, now this happened probably not in a physical way I mean I don't really see how it could have been maybe it was I just don't know uh, maybe I just don't understand how that works but I I went there and the doctor was there and the nurses a couple of the nurses were still there some of them were gone but they had a whole uh, lineup of children and they were putting, the nurses came around on each child, they gave them like a, a yellow rubbery kind of bracelet put on their right, their right arm. And the nurses came up and they put one on my arm and I just looked at it and I took it and I threw it down on the floor because I didn't want it. And, and the nurse picked it up and she put it back on me and I took it off again and the doctor said, don't, she doesn't need a bracelet, don't worry about her. And I, I stood down there, you know, the same place where I had looked up and seen the double doors, the metal doors. I was in that same room and I was standing there with the doctor and I had remembered when I was there as a child, he had a desk, like a wooden writing desk there. And he used to sit there uh, near the base of the stairs. 
And so when I was older and went there, about 25, I said to him, I remember you, and I remember your desk used to be right there. And he looked at me like, oh, my God, like he couldn't believe that I remembered that, and I remembered him and everything. He was pretty shocked. There's my dog barking out there. <laughs> but, um, What's yeah. your dog's name? Saint. Saint. He's Saint. Uh, is he a uh, German Shepherd? No, he's kind. Of, he's a German Shepherd mix. He's like a German Shepherd Husky kind of mix. But when he was a puppy, I I thought he might have been a Saint Bernard. I wasn't sure, so I called him Saint. Cool. And the name stuck. But anyway, yeah, that's a little bit, you know, from my childhood. Um, so that was around, you know, seven years old when that. I would say when that started, but I guess it must have started before that. Yeah. Go so forward then, to your next interesting. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, let's see. Um, when I was nine years old, okay, when I was nine years old, uh, one morning I was getting ready for school and uh, waiting for the school bus to come pick me up. And my mom and dad were both there, and we had already eaten breakfast. And my mom and dad both went out on the front step of the house. And they called me out there like, Bonnie, come out here. And so I went out, and we were all three standing on the front step there. And above our house was an object floating above our house. And there was a cloud cover, pretty low cloud cover, that that morning and so what we saw when we looked up was an oblong an oblong object we could only see the bottom of it sticking out of the bottom of this cloud and it was i'm going to guesstimate how old are you now nine years old okay and you're still in virginia yeah i moved to a different part of virginia i was on the east coast now so it's still in Virginia. What's the name of the town you were in? It remember? was called it was called Greenbackville. Okay, go ahead. So um, this thing was uh, just floating right above our house. The bottom of it was hanging out of the cloud. And so it was it was an oblong object and it, I was about maybe maybe 30 foot long and it looked like white milk glass like it like it was glass kind of a cloudy white milky glass and the light was kind of shining through it it was almost translucent and we could see from underneath the shadows of little feet and little legs moving around back and forth in the bottom of this thing <clears throat> and my parents i remember they were like just bewildered they were like what is that and they were trying to figure it out and they the only thing they could come up with was a dirigible <laughs> like there was a dirigible up there just floating in one place <laughs> over our house with a glass bottom and uh but they i don't think they were really convinced with that but that was the only thing they could think of and we stood there for probably a good like at least 10 minutes maybe 15 minutes watching it and it went up into the cloud and the cloud came down around the bottom of it and uh, obscured it so it was just a cloud up there but we kept watching and about after about five minutes it came back down again and it was just hovering right there and we saw the little legs moving around and my parents just couldn't figure out what it was and I, I didn't really know what to think and uh, I, I was getting ready for school and my school bus came and I went I get on the bus and I went to school and uh, my parents told me later that you know they watched it for a little bit longer and then it went back up into the cloud and it disappeared so we never did figure out what that was but um then another thing happened when I was nine years old. 
so my mom, my dad had gone to work. This was in the morning. And I guess it was summertime. And um, so I didn't have school, but my little sister was going to some type of uh, summertime program for little kids. And there was a bus that would come pick her up every morning. Well, she missed the bus. So my mom uh, brought her <clears throat> in the car. So I was left there at the house with my little baby sister, who was probably only a year old or maybe less. And so I was nine years old. And because I was very, you know, intuitive and psychic, I, that day, I felt kind of scared because I felt a presence in the house. And I sat in the recliner in the living room. And from my vantage point, I could see through the living room, the dining room, the kitchen, and then into the back bathroom, all the way across the house to the other side of the house, I could see. And I just knew there was something in the house. And I kept staring into the bathroom. And I saw around the bathroom door, this hand came around and almost like it wasn't completely physical, almost like it was a shadow of a hand. It came around, it was underneath of the doorknob. So whatever it was seemed a little short. And so I watched this and the, the fingers on the hand were long. It was not a human hand. And so I just, my heart started beating really hard and my eyes were just wide open and I was just staring. And this thing, whatever it was, it became invisible to me. I couldn't see it, but it was walking across the floor it came out of the bathroom, through the kitchen. I heard it walking on the floor. It came across the dining room, which was an old wooden floor, and I heard the boards creaking. I knew there was something walking. Now, my little sister was in her crib. This was in a hallway uh, in between the living room and the dining room. And this thing, whatever it was, walked across the floor and went into the hallway to where my baby sister was and she started crying and I jumped up and I ran in there and I went ah, and I scared the creature away and I you know I had to be very brave because I was I felt scared but I didn't want anything to mess with my little sister so I scared it away and I picked her up and she was crying and I, you know, I held her and I rocked her. And I kissed her and I told her it's okay. And uh, she stopped crying and I, I put her back down and, you know, covered her up with her blanket and made her comfortable. And I stood there for a few minutes and I looked around and I, I felt like the creature, whatever it was, had gone. And I went back into the living room and sat in the recliner where I was. And I just kind of sat there kind of petrified until my mom got home. And uh, I don't really remember if I told my mom about it or not. Maybe not. I don't think I did because I had so many experiences where I tried to tell her. And she'd always say, honey, you know, it's just a dream or it's just your imagination Oops. or whatever. So... Yeah, that was that was nine years old. And. Yeah, it, so in that house, um, I think we probably. I think we probably had a ghost in the house because uh, sometimes the whole family would hear something walking around. Either it was a ghost or it was, the, you know, one of the creatures, <laughs> an alien or, or whatever it was. Uh, but one day I remember. And this this maybe was, you know, 10 years old, uh, the whole family. Well, my my bedroom was upstairs. All of our bedrooms were upstairs. And because I was the big sister, I had my own room and I had put uh, a lock like a latch on the outside of my door, like up high to keep my to keep my little sister out of my room. And when I usually I would like close my door and, and latch the door. But this time I had left it wide open because we were all downstairs anyway. And so 
<laughs> we were all downstairs in the living room. We we're just sitting there talking. Me and, and my my two sisters and my mom and dad. And we all heard something walking upstairs in the hallway. And then it really sounded like my bedroom door closed and the door latched. You know, it was like a little metal hook so we could hear it. And I, and we all heard it. We all looked at each other and I, I ran up the stairs to my room and sure enough, the door was closed and locked and had been latched. And I knew it didn't leave it that way. So it was unusual. And my mom and dad were open to that kind of thing. They believed in spirits and ghosts and that type of thing. Um, so there was that. And I guess when I was 11, I had more experiences with the star people. And I remember one night I was, I was in my room in bed going to sleep and, um, I had my window, I had a couple of windows that I could see out and I was looking out the window as I was laying there and I saw a, a white light, what, you know, kind of looked like a shooting star, but, or a meteor. But it came down to the ground uh, right in town where we were and it went behind some buildings and I really saw this thing and it was, you know, it was a big white light. It came down and it landed someplace. And so I, I called out to my dad and he came in the room and I told him what I saw and, and he assured me that it was okay and that in the morning he would, he'd go out there and he'd investigate to see what it was. And uh, he did go out there in the morning and he didn't see any, see anything. And so... Um, is this still in Greenbikeville? Uh, no, this is this is now in a place called Chincoteague. Chincoteague? Chincoteague Island, yeah. Which is where? It's on the east coast of Virginia. It's right on the Atlantic Ocean. How do you spell it? Chicka It's spelled C H I N C O T E A G U E. Chicka oh, It's a Native American Indian word. What's on the island? Well, it's a small island. It's about seven miles long by two miles wide. And there's I think when I was growing up, there may have been about 5,000 people there. Um, so everybody knew each other. You know, it's like a big family, big community. What did your parents do? Um, well, they're artists. They were, uh, my dad was a decoy carver and uh, my mother was a painter. And they worked together. They created some beautiful art. And you know what? I don't know if you can see them right back here. There's a couple of their decoys right behind me. I can see but, them, um, yes. Yeah. So that was what they did for a living, really, um, from when I was little and until their whole lives, until my dad passed away. Um, so they were artists. And that, that was kind of a thing there on the island because there were a lot of duck hunters. And um, so decoy carving was a was a thing there, like a pastime and a hobby, and some people sold decoys. And there's also uh, wild horses, not really on Chincoteague, but there's another island called Assateague, which is a wildlife refuge, and there are wild ponies that live there, and it's, it's very famous for um, their annual pony swim, which they just had this week. It's the end of July every year they have this pony swim, where the ponies there's cowboys. The cowboys go over to Assateague and they herd up the horses and they swim across the channel to Chincoteague. And it's it's kind of all through the fire department. They take care of the horses all year long. And so they're allowed to keep a certain amount of horses on Assateague. Since it's a wildlife refuge, they have to kind of limit the numbers. I think it's 150 ponies. And so the new um, babies that are born are auctioned off like every year they have an auction and people come from all over the world and it's a famous pony penning it's called and they buy the ponies <laughs> that's cool 
yeah, uh, it is. It's some parts of the United States that people don't know about, usually. So yeah. go, go on with your experiences. Okay. Um, so, okay, so when, yeah, when I was 11 years old, still, I think it was 11 or 12, I had another experience where, so it was during the night, and I saw, I saw another light in the sky, and I actually saw a, like a silver disc craft landing next to my house, in the parking lot next to my house. And so I ran outside and these beings came out of this silver disc. I think there were five of them. And they were... You're talking about on the island, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, just give us the name of the island again. Chincoteague. Chincoteague. Okay. <laughs> so... Um, there were about five of them. They came out of the craft, and they were what I would call star people. And these were tall, very thin, tall, and um, their skin was kind of a like an off-white, kind of creamy, yellowish, light color. And they had kind of normal human-sized heads, but they didn't have any hair. And their eyes were fairly normal-sized. Um, you know, a little bit bigger than a human's eyes. And their eyes seemed to be, some of them had black, and some of them had what looked like blue eyes. <clears throat> and so um, this, I think, was the first time I'd seen them. I'm not sure, but they already knew me, because they, they called me by name. And we sat at a picnic table in my yard, and I was very excited. I, I wasn't afraid of them. I was very excited to see them. And I was just very curious. And we sat there and they they gave me something to eat. And they were eating it too. And it looked like little squares of green jello. Just like little squares. We would just pick up and eat it. And so we sat at the picnic table talking and doing this. And... Um, we had a good visit, and they, they well, told me... Stop, stop for a second. Uh, hold, okay. hold your thought. So describe what they look like. Well, they were tall. They were... Um, I'd say they have to be at least six foot tall. And they all pretty much look the same. And they were really thin. Um, and like I said, their heads were like normal human size. The eyes were pretty pretty much human size and they had no no hair um, and they kind of just looked almost like clones of each other they looked very much alike and they were very friendly and um, yeah I just I had a good visit with them and they they asked me if they could come back and see me again and I said yes so what did the squares taste like I, I mean, from what I remember, they just reminded me of Jello. So I, they must have tasted pretty good uh, because I, I liked it. I ate it. And, uh, you know, nobody forced me to do it. I, I enjoyed eating it. So I think it, it might have been, you know, did, like a did sugary you get treat. Any effects from the effects from the squares? <laughs> I don't think so. No, not, not sitting there. No. I don't think I got any effect from it. And they were they were eating them too. Okay, go home go home with your story. So then um then so that's all I remember from that. I woke up the next morning and I was very excited. I jumped out of bed and I just happened to have my cousins staying with me that night. And so I told them all about it. I was very excited. I said, A UFO landed in the parking lot. And they were like, oh, my God, you know, we got to go look. And so we had to go and, you know, look for markings and look for evidence. And, you know, we made this, we became detectives for the day. And I remember I had my notebook and I was taking notes <laughs> out in the parking lot. We didn't really see anything. We didn't find any signs or anything. Of course, I told my parents and they were like, okay, honey, go outside and play. <laughs> you know, um, but I was outside a lot. They didn't you know. believe you again, did they? No, 
I mean, <laughs> they never really did. <laughs> they never really did. Okay, but they were ahead. very sweet about it. They weren't, you know, they were never mean about it or anything, but yeah. What was your next so, experience? Um, oh my gosh. Well, hmm. My next experience was, I think, I think what happened was when I became a teenager, I didn't pay attention to all that stuff so much anymore because I really got caught up in school and I was in band and I was on the track team and I was in majorettes and I played guitar and I was just into so many different things, you know, just living life. You're still living I, on Chica Tica. Yeah. Okay, yeah. go ahead. And um, so I didn't have a whole lot that I recall. I'm sure things happened, but I just didn't really pay attention because I was busy with other stuff. But um, when it really picks up again is um, in my early 20s. And so what happened was, I guess I was about 19 years old. And... I read a book by Edgar Casey, the famous psychic, and he um, he advised people to record their dreams. He said that if you make a dream journal, you record your dreams every morning, it will help you in your life because, you know, sometimes your mind's trying to work out problems and um, sometimes this happens, like dreams are your is your subconscious mind talking to your conscious mind. And so it comes out in symbolism. And if you write down your dreams every day, you'll be able to see this symbolism and you'll see patterns develop. You know, let's say if you dream about water a lot, you know, and you'll say, look at each dream that has water in it. And it's like, oh, what does it mean to me? And so you develop your own dream dictionary. And so I started doing that. I started writing my dreams down every morning when I was about 19. And so I did. I, it took me about four months to train my brain to do this because I didn't always remember my dreams when I woke up in the morning. But you can actually train yourself to do that. And so I started remembering, you know, four or five dreams every morning when I woke up and I write them down right away. And so while I was in the process of doing this and I did find the symbolism and I found the patterns and I made my own dream dictionary and all of that, but there are these other experiences that were not dreams. And these, it seems like when I was a teenager, I kind of forgot about the star people, you know, from my childhood. And, but I rediscovered them pretty quickly when, <laughs> when I was doing this and writing the dreams down and I realized that there were these experiences where it seemed like I was wide awake. It wasn't a dream. It was very vivid and very real to me. I didn't quite know, you know, how to categorize that in my dream journal. So I just wrote it all down and I kept the, the data to look at later. And I looked at it probably about a year later or so. And about the same time, I... I tried to read the book Intruders by Bud Hopkins, which talks about a, a lady who is an abductee, and she had some pretty horrible experiences, very scary. And so I tried to read a couple of pages of that, and it was, it was frightening to me, and so I put it down. And it took me a while to pick it back up again. And then... I, I read a couple of chapters probably, and then it, it just, it was like a trigger. And it brought back a lot of memories from my childhood and everything I had experienced. And it just, it just hit me so hard. And I remember just the emotional reaction. I dropped the book and I just, hot tears started coming down my face. And I just remembered everything like all at once. And then <laughs> looking at my dream journal, I was like, okay, now this makes sense. Like, maybe this is what's happening. And when I looked back at those experiences where I was so awake and aware, there were these beings, you know, there were these little 
three or four foot tall beings that I was interacting with. And so when this trigger happened in my mind, it just like set something off. And immediately after that, I started having visits from the star people again a lot, like once or twice a week. And this happened for about five years. And so I started what I call the star people school where they would come and uh, meet with me. Basically, they became my teachers. And so in the beginning, in my early 20s, what would happen is they would come into my room at night. And this was before going to sleep. I would I could feel the, a presence. And I would be laying there and I would start to feel a presence in the room and sometimes I would actually see them like two or three small beings in the room and sometimes my body would become paralyzed and I'd start to feel all tingly like all throughout my body like pins and needles and literally they were taking me out of my body they were taking my conscious awareness out of my body they were helping me to raise my vibrational frequency and they were lowering theirs a little bit so we were meeting like halfway and they explained to me that they couldn't really they could they could manifest physically for a short time but in order for them to do this work with me and and do the teaching and everything we really need to be in a place where we could work together better and I think this is the etheric plane. I, I end up calling it the alternate reality for myself. You know, I labeled it for myself like I labeled them star people. I call it the alternate reality because for me, it literally was this other place where I go and I have real experiences. It's real life. It's just not completely physical in nature. So they were coming into my room and I'd go through the whole thing of like sometimes I was wide awake with my eyes open. I would keep my eyes open as I used to do as a child in the dark. And I could just see the whole thing play out. And my physical body was like all my muscles would relax and go to sleep. The body itself was kind of going to sleep. But my conscious awareness was awake, awake and aware and very alert. And I would feel myself like I drew a picture of this too. This is in my first book, Journey with the Star People. I can remember one time there was two of them at, at the right near my head, right near my pillow. And when my body was asleep, but my mind was awake, they pulled me out by my shoulders and I felt myself just floating out of the bed by my shoulders. They float me right, right through the wall, right through the wall outside onto their craft where we we did all types of different things there were like physical examinations there was a period i went through where they did take um ovum from me and there was the creation of hybrid children and at the same time this teaching was happening like they were showing me how to uh mentally focus and i mean i was already psychic but they were doing psychic testing with me and there were other human people doing this with me they were like classmates and there was a group of us <clears throat> and uh they they would teach us like how to mentally do things like to focus and so in the beginning they did this they would come into my room take me out of my room i go through the whole process but after a couple of years i learned how to do it by myself so they stopped coming into my room to get me i would just leave my body and go meet with them it was a lot easier <laughs> a lot more simple to do it that way and uh but for those five years it was intense and so they taught me they taught me to face my fear they taught me 
uh, how to defend myself against psychic attack, whether it was from uh, humans or aliens or whatever it was. They taught me how to protect myself and they taught me how to focus mentally and they started showing me this thing they called uh, or I called energy manipulation. Like I would, me and my classmates would do this, like hold out my hand and create a ball of light in my hand, like a little ball of energy. And that was the foundation, like the base of creating an object out of this. And I was creating like apples and oranges and flowers and stuff like that. But when they were doing the, the self-defense training with me, I started creating a knife in my hand. So if I was in a bad situation where I felt like I had to defend myself, I could instantly have a knife in my hand. And I, unfortunately, I needed to know how to do that because I started experiencing military abduction. Some nights after I would have a visit with the star people and I would come back to my, to my bed and then I would... I started seeing like men, <clears throat> like government agents, I was calling them. They were coming and asking me, what did you do with the star people? And what kinds of things did you do? What did they say to you? And they wanted me to tell them everything. And I did <laughs> for a little while. I did because I didn't know any better at the time. And so I went right along with what they asked and I told them everything. And then I started to feel like, um, like they were bad people and I didn't want to talk to them anymore. I started to gain insight about who they really were. And so I didn't talk to them anymore. And when I refused to answer their questions, they started to attack me and they sent military trained psychic attackers to come after me and and what they would do is basically try to scare me try to scare me so bad that i didn't have control over myself and then they could get the information out of me you know by force basically and it was just amazing you know whirlwind of activity star people and government agents and you know psychic attack and all of this happening so at the same time. did you ever um come to understand who the humans were do you mean the government agents or the people in my class the government agents well i've learned a lot since then <laughs> that was only in the beginning um, yeah, I have a pretty good idea of, of who they are now. But, um, yeah, I call them the controllers. Uh, so, okay. Um, I don't want to get into my story because we'll pull you off. But, um, so you say you figure out who they are, but you're giving them a name that's fairly... Um, generic so what have you did you ever being all the talent you have of getting out of your body and being psychic and going here and going there you never fo uh, followed the your controllers back to where they came from to figure out I who, have yeah? I have yeah. okay well then we want the we want the nitty-gritty <laughs> we're not we're not uh, we're not going to settle for the uh, yeah. surface stuff. We want the details. Well, okay, let's see. I had a, one time, I had a uh, an experience, a psychic attack. This, this military trained psychic attacker, um, see if I can remember this correctly. Okay, so what happened was uh, one night I went to sleep as usual and I woke up and I was, I was outside. I was in a neighborhood. 
I wasn't really familiar with, but I was outside at night and I was I was very aware, very awake. And I was walking down the street and it was nighttime. It seemed like everybody was asleep. And I was walking down the sidewalk and I soon noticed that there was a man on the other side of the street, on the on the other sidewalk across the street, and he was kind of keeping keeping up with me, my own pace. And I I got a bad feeling from him, from his energy, and so I started running, and then he started running. And so I went off of the sidewalk and I ran through people's backyards, and he caught up with me pretty quickly. And <sighs> He grabbed me from behind, he grabbed my hair and he pulled me backwards and we got into this fist fight and I created a knife in my hand and I managed to get him down on the ground. I was I was actually on top of him cutting his throat and he was a great psychic because he just started singing and ignoring me and, and this is what you would do. You know, because you you already know that you're out of body. And if you get your head cut off, it's not really getting your head cut off. But you could you could so, really. So you're astral projecting at the time. You're not in physical. Yeah, right. Right. OK, go this, ahead. this was in uh, the alternate reality. OK, uh, but I was very, very conscious, uh, even though I was out of my body and. Um, so I did manage to get away from him and I woke up in my bed, but I knew that he would be coming back. And so, so what I did was I, I followed him the next night. I went to look for him and I, I found him and he wasn't in a military base, but I saw him and he was like sleeping in oh, his own stop, bed. Stop, stop. So you went out of your body to find him. You found his physical body? Um, I was out of my body, and I guess I did find his physical body, but I, what I was focused on was finding out what he was afraid of because I was going to use his own tactics against him because that's what the psychic attackers do. They use fear to control people, and I knew that he would probably try to come back and find me again. And I, it was kind of a brief out of body excursion, but what I was able to do was to find out what he was afraid of. And I found out that he was afraid of snakes. And so what I did was after I woke up the next morning, I just focused on that uh, because I had a feeling he would come back again pretty soon. And so I focused on becoming a snake <laughs> I focused on the energy of a snake and I did this all day long. I imagined that I was a snake. I imagined what a snake might feel like. And that night I went to sleep and I was very aware when I went to sleep and I knew that I would have to pay attention in case he came back again. And I went through about three dreams that were just normal dreams and I didn't see him. But then the fourth, the fourth dream came around and I found myself in a small wooden room. There was nothing in the room. It was just a small, probably like a, you know, a 12 by 12 square wooden room. And I, I was just very focused and uh, he came in the door and he saw me there. And I was still, you know, in my mind, I had practiced focusing on what it must be like to be a snake so I could scare this guy. And I don't know if this is going to work or not, but he came in the room and he saw me and he was he was very happy with himself to have found me standing there. And I waited until he got very close to me. And then I just I just allowed this energy to come out of me and this whole snake energy i i morphed into a snake i morphed into like a 10 foot tall cobra and all these baby snakes tiny like hundreds and hundreds of 
snakes shot out of me. I didn't even I wasn't even doing it. I I just didn't know what was going to happen. And they went inside of him and he froze. And he was very shocked. He definitely was not expecting that. And I think I think it was a lot for him to handle, a lot a big shock for his body to handle, probably his physical body. And he never came back again. I never saw him again after that. But that's just one example of you know, a psychic attack and trying to defend myself. But so I have... How did, stop for a second. So how did you know, uh, being as you're doing astral projection and you're in an alternate reality, first of all, how did you come to understand he was anything other than something you were making up within the that realm? How did you know he was... A, a physical human agent that was astral projecting like you were? How did you come to that understanding? Um, well, it wasn't the first time. I'd already had a lot of experience with psychic attackers. And just because, maybe it's because I'm just very intuitive and psychic and my third eye's been active my whole life. And I, for me, the physical world and the spirit world blend together. They are not separate. And so the things that I learn when I'm out of body are just as relevant to me as when I'm in my physical body. And I just, after years of experience, just gained this understanding. And it wasn't the first time. And I had been to military bases. I had been underground. And, and doing this, most likely out of body, all right, um, stop, stop. So if you caught my attention, now go back to where you were underground and wherever you just mentioned. Okay. And what what age are you? And give us, start from the beginning, whatever age you, that was. Okay, let me think for a minute. Okay. When I was about, I guess, 21 years old, I had an experience where a uh, one of these government agents, psychic, came into my house, and I uh, I assume this was I mean, physically came in your house in a physical body. Once again, I. I think this was out of body. I think okay. this was an alternate reality experience. Right. Sure. But for me, just, as, just real. as real. Okay. Just as ahead. real. All right. That's fine. Go ahead. Okay. So I, I went to sleep as usual. I got up. I woke up. Okay. So when I woke up, it's hard for me to even know. Am I physical or am I out of my body? It's either way is so real to me. I got up out of my bed and walked to the kitchen and there was a man standing there in my kitchen and he was a government agent and he was wearing a brown suit. He didn't appear to be like wearing a military uniform, but he was one of these, what I call a government agent. And he, he asked me, he started talking to me and he asked me if I would go someplace with him. And I said, yes. Now this was early on. Uh, before I learned that they were not very good people. This was like 21 years old. And so I don't know how he did this, but he brought me with him. We traveled to this underground base and we were inside of a room. It was under underground for sure. There were no windows. The walls were, they seemed to be probably like concrete maybe and they were painted gray and <clears throat> we were in a room and then uh, a woman came in and she there were tables like wooden tables and he asked me to wait in this room we were waiting for something and this lady came in and she sat with him at a table 
And at that time, I, you know, I was just very young and still very, you know, exploring and very curious. And I started flying. I started flying around the room, you know, just having fun and just waiting for whatever it was we were waiting for. And so then, then he was ready. And so he led me into another room. It was a big open area. And off of this big open area were smaller rooms. And I could see into them because there were windows on these rooms. And they, they were kind of smallish rooms, like maybe 10 by 10 rooms, and seemed to be mostly empty. So it was in this big open room, this big area, and there were two or three doctors wearing lab coats. And they asked me to lay on this table. It was a like a silver metal table because they wanted to get a lock on my frequency. This was what they said to me. And I was like, sure. And so I went and I laid on the table and they hooked all these little um, electrodes up to me all over my body. And they gave me a shot of something in my arm. And they said that it was to, uh, to help me calm down. And I was fine with all of it. I, I felt fine with it at the time. And we, they stood there around me and they were waiting and I was just laying there. And I, after a couple of minutes, I actually got bored. Um, and I sat up and they said, no, no, you're almost there. You're almost there. Just, you know, hold on. And, and I sat there for another minute and I, I just got too bored and I pulled these stickers off of me and I got up. And I went to explore the rest of this building. Now, these doctors in the lab coats were very, very disappointed. And I didn't understand why, but they did not get that lock on my frequency. So I got up and I walked from this huge room. Uh, there was a, like an open door that led to a hallway. I went down this hallway partway. And there were different rooms and some of the doors were open. The first room that I saw was on my left and there was like a purple light coming out of this room. And I looked into the room. I didn't see any people in there, um, but just this weird purple light emanating from this room. And then I heard some people talking at the end of this hallway and I didn't go down there because I, I thought, you know, I probably shouldn't go down that way for some reason, but I turned around. I came back out to the big open room where the doctors were. And then I, I went in the other direction where I saw these like 10 by 10 rooms that had the windows on them. And I went into one of these rooms because I thought I saw two aliens sitting there in this little room. And I went inside the room and what appeared to be aliens sitting on this bench like sitting on a wooden bench and I I said hi what are you guys doing in here and I was like trying to talk to them but they did not respond to me and I I got closer and I looked at them you know closely and I touched one of them and the head fell off and I realized it was a suit and that kind of made me angry thinking that um you know, I'm here in this government base and they have alien suits. And I was confused about that. And at that point, a security guard walked around. He was like right at the doorway. And I came out and I saw him there at the doorway. And I, I was a little angry and I said, why are there fake aliens in here? Why are there alien suits in here? And he actually said to me, we use those to gain the confidence of people like yourself. He said that to me. And so I got kind of angry and I went out back into the main area where the doctors were. And I walked past them again, back into this other hallway where I had seen the purple light coming out of the room. And then I, once again, I heard the voices at the end of the hallway and I decided to go down there. And so I walked all the way down to the end of this hallway. And once again, it was kind of like a, a dark gray hallway. It was like painted gray. 
So at this, there was an open doorway, another room, and there was probably, you know, six or seven people in there. And they were all young men, probably in the early 20s or so. And at that point, I realized these are probably um, psychics and they are training. These are military psychics. And when they saw me, uh, they got angry and they rushed at me. And so I ran and I ran down the hallway. I ran back through where the doctors were in the lab coats. And I ran back through the first room where the government agent had brought me and the wooden tables were in this meeting room. And I, I ran, I started flying in this room. I was looking for a way out and I found a doorway and there was a double doorway that that opened up and I flew, I flew out up into the air and I flew as fast as I could because I was trying to escape these psychics that were running after me. And I looked down behind me and I saw that we were in a marsh. There was water, there was cattails and there was no building to be seen, but I could see the double doors that were open. So clearly it had been underground and possibly it was nearby where I lived because the environment was very familiar. There was the water, the marsh, the cattails, there was pine trees. And when I realized, you know, that what was happening, I actually started crying and I, but I kept flying and I went towards what I, you know, I was trying to get back home and I was trying to wake up and I did, I eventually woke up in my bed. So, and I wrote all this down when I woke up in the morning. So that was one experience in an underground base. And um, there's another one I could tell you about that happened uh, more recently. I was probably about uh, 40 years old, maybe in my early 40s when this happened. And, but I just want to say briefly that I learned a lot from the star people. I went through the star people school and I graduated from that early training. And then I was on my own for a while doing my own thing. But then later the star people, the star people came back and worked with me again. And they taught me a lot more. Um, and they taught me about the shift of, of human consciousness and the big awakening that we're going through now was their main was their main uh, teaching for me. But this uh, experience I had, I went underground again one night, and I think this was probably out of body in the alternate reality. And so what happened was I went to sleep. I went to bed that night as usual. And I woke up and I was in a different place, but I was wide awake. I was consciously aware. And so what I saw first was kind of a meeting area with humans. And what I saw were walls that were kind of curved walls. And they looked like a, a rusty brown kind of like it was metal that was rusted. And I was in this meeting area. It was supposed to be during the day, um, but there were no windows. There was no sunlight or anything. I got the impression that it was underground. And so I saw these people lived under the ground. They lived in this place, in this rusted out old place. They lived there. There were humans there. There were some families who even had children and everybody was very solemn. And I saw a family, there were two children and the parents, parents were on the outside and the kids were in the center and they were all holding hands and they were very close to each other. And uh, everybody just kind of, you know, they clearly were not happy. They didn't really want to be there. I don't know how they got there. Um, but they were living there and everybody had like a little apartment where, where they lived in. And this was supposed to be their daytime hours where they're having like a social activity. And 
I was standing next to a, a very nice lady who was, spoke to me. And what they were doing was they were like trading. She had some items, like some clothing and some, some little trinkets. It was almost like, um, like she was having a yard sale. Um, and there was a number of people doing this, but they were trading items together. And this was supposed to be their social time. And so she, this nice lady asked me if I wanted to, you know, sit with her while, while she was doing this. And I, I said, sure. And I was just observing everybody. And as we were sitting there, a military officer walked in to this area. He was very tall, uh, very big, very broad, broad shoulders, and he was reptilian. At first, I, I didn't realize until he got close to me, and then I could tell from the way he looked, he, he seemed to be kind of disguised as a human, but clearly he was a reptilian, and everybody was afraid of him. Everybody looked away when he came in. Everybody put their heads down and looked away and he came and he was wearing a like an olive drab army officer's uniform and he was wearing a hat and um, he came right up to me and he asked me, he said, um, after you're done here, can I ask you a few questions? And I said, sure. And he turned around and he walked back from where he came from. And so I was there with this lady uh, during this meeting time and a whistle went off. It was like the end of the day work whistle, uh, you know, time to clean up and go back to your quarters kind of thing. And I watched everybody clean up their stuff and they're going back to their quarters and I knew that after they put everything away, they were going to a cafeteria to eat their dinner. And then after that, they'd go back to their rooms for the night. So, you know, I'd been in this one area the whole time and I'd noticed that the walls had a weird curve to them, but I didn't know until I walked out into the center of this place where we really were. And so the reptilian officer came back and he kind of nodded towards me and I, I walked towards him. I followed him out to the center of this place. And then I could see that we were inside of this, a huge tube, a huge metal tube under the ground, which had many different levels, many different floors. And the center of this was hollow and I could look down and see many different floors going down and it got darker and darker and I couldn't see the very bottom. And when I looked up, I saw just the littlest bit of sunlight coming through. And that's how I knew then that we were underground. And <clears throat> I also saw up there a disturbing sight of what looked like a huge metal hook and hanging from this hook was a human. Looked like he was wearing clothes and he was hanging from the back of his shoulders. And I didn't know if he was dead or alive. I hoped he was just asleep. He was just, you know, silently hanging there. And <clears throat> so this reptilian military officer is standing next to me and he asked me to step forward a little bit more towards the edge of this huge hollow that went way way down and and it was i mean it was it was huge <clears throat> it was a really big place but i could see like the walls were all like old metal like rusted metal it was really old and there were some people walking around but they looked like they worked there i could see across the way you know the other side of the tube it was all circular and so I, I stepped up to the edge and the next thing I know, I was lifted up very swiftly and I, I didn't know what grabbed me. I thought maybe it was one of these iron hooks that the fellow was hanging from and it, it didn't hurt me or anything, but I was lifted up 
by like the back of my shoulders somehow. And then, and it brought me to the center of this hollow. And then I just dropped like in free fall. And it was, it was very, uh, you know, very terrifying, but I closed my eyes and I, I knew I couldn't be afraid. This is something I learned from the star people as part of, you know, self-defense to never be afraid, never be afraid ever. That's my motto because when you're afraid, then you're out of control. So I closed my eyes and I was just falling very fast in free fall. And I wondered, you know, if I was gonna hit the bottom and die. And then I thought, probably not, you know, they wouldn't have gone through the trouble to, to bring me here and to go through all this. They could have killed me any time. So I was like at peace. And so the falling sensation stopped. I opened my eyes and I was just sitting up. I was on a bed and I was just sitting up. Obviously I had lost consciousness and I had missing time. So I just sat up in this bed. It was a well-lit room and it, it, it was a small, like it was a white room. It was painted white. It looked very modern and new compared to the rest of the place. It wasn't old. It looked brand new, this room. And the reptilian military officer came in the doorway of this room and, and nodded to me and I knew I was supposed to go with him again. So I got up off of this bed and I went with him. As soon as I left this room, this white room that was really well lit and everything, once again, I was in the really old rusted out metal underground base and it was very, very dark down at the bottom. We were at the bottom of this place. And there was, it looked like we were in an old mine shaft. And there was an elevator there that looked like something out of an old mine shaft. And uh, it was a, like a rickety old elevator. And, it, you know, it wasn't even enclosed. It was like, um, like old rusted wire, you know, like a fence kind of wire just wrapped around it. And you could see inside of it. And uh, so he stepped up into this elevator and I got in there with him. It was just enough room for two of us. And he hit some levers or some buttons and the elevator started going up and I lost consciousness again. And so I don't know what happened after that. I ended up waking up back in my bed at home, safe and sound after that happened. Um, so, um, uh, have you ever named your, the reality you go to beyond uh, alternate reality, you know, given it a more specific name or, or come to understand it, uh, in any context in reference to your current life? Well, um, I, <clears throat> I think that there's the astral plane and there's the etheric plane. And I think possibly what I'm calling the alternate reality is the etheric plane. Because from what I've learned, the star people, this is the easiest way for them to work with us because the etheric plane basically is the blueprint for the physical plane. And I always wondered like when I would wake up in the morning and I'd have a scar on the back of my hand, I got a couple of scars in the back of my hand from them and scoop marks, they would take skin samples. I have a scoop mark, you know, taken out when I wake up in the morning and be physically present, but it didn't seem like I was physically going with them. And so I think what was happening is um, I was going out of my body from my physical body to my etheric form. And this is where they're doing all this work and taking skin samples and stuff. They're taking it from the etheric body and which directly manifests physically on the physical form. And I think that's how we can explain, you know, when they come and take us out of our room and they float us through a wall or a closed window, you know, and, and that's kind of hard to explain if you are always looking at it in a physical sense, you know, it seems undoable. 
But I think really they, they have been taking me out of my physical body, I going to my etheric form, and I'm still awake and aware and conscious, but I'm in this other form. And I think the alternate reality is the etheric plane. So, um, how many different races are you connected with? Just one or two or more? Or what? What's the? What's the? What is your? Uh, the context of your alien contact. Okay, I think uh, for the most part, uh, <clears throat> the beings that have been with me most often, I think they are what people would call Pleiadian. They are. Which means? Because, you know, I've heard that there are like two or three hundred different races in the Pleiades. So. Okay. You know, we that makes sense. we have we have a tendency to uh, believe we know wh who the Pleiadians are when when it's like yeah, there's a whole bunch of Pleiadians and they're all very different from each other, but they just yeah. come from the Pleiades. So True. What, what, do you, yeah. what do you call the Pleiadians? What does that mean to you? And I, I don't always call them Pleiadian. I kind of do that for other people when other when people ask me this question. So um, I, I call these my star family and they are, they're pretty tall and very thin. They are about six foot tall, seven foot tall. They can get even taller, but I'd say in general, they're about six, six and a half foot tall. They have kind of a creamy white skin, like an off white kind of color. They look rather human, except that their skin is a lighter color. They do have uh, like a fairly normal human sized head and human sized eyes. They normally don't have any hair, although some of them have white hair or blonde hair, and it's usually kind of thin hair. Um, they have black eyes or sometimes blue eyes. And um, so, do they look like humans, or do they look like greys? Do they look insectoid? Uh, which they look, a lot of the they look more look human. They yeah, look they like look humans. more human. Yeah, the ones I'm, the ones I kind of consider my family, they look more human. But I've also interacted a lot with these other beings who I don't know where they're from, but they they're about four foot tall, five foot tall, and their skin is kind of a tan or yellowish color. They do have pretty large heads with big black eyes. I don't consider them grays though. Um, not sure where they come from, but I've been with them a lot. And then the grays, I have seen the grays and there are many different types of grays also. Some of them are, sure. yeah, some of them are pretty malicious. Um, but some of them, it seems like the grays that are a little bit taller, um, these are more uh, friendly, benevolent, and they have taught me um, a little bit about the shift. And so I have interacted with them, and I, I have interacted with reptilians on occasion. Uh, most of it's been pretty negative uh, with the reptilians. But I, I've also seen other beings that only came once or twice just to see me, sometimes to take a skin sample. And so there have been many different types, but the main ones for me are these taller, kind of off-white color, look more human-like. And uh, they're the ones I call my star family. So um, how many races have you met where you weren't in the alternate rally when you were here in the physical? Um, it's kind of hard to say. I mean, <clears throat> I've had physical experiences. <laughs> well, well, recently. So, so, so go through go through some of your memorable experiences that were uh, here that you know were on the physical that were not in the etheric or the 
astral planes. Go through uh, one or two memorable experiences that, okay. that stand out in your mind. When I ask that question, which experiences come to your mind? Well, the, the first one that comes to my mind is something that happened um, probably about um, five years ago. It was here on the beach in Uruguay. And um, physically, uh, my husband and I were out on the beach and it was um, it was the off season. So we were pretty much the only ones on the beach. Um, but we noticed uh, this two people started walking towards us up the beach and when they as they got closer i noticed really noticed the energy of this lady uh was unusual and so we ended up meeting these people so one of them was appeared to be they both appeared to be human one of them was human one of them was not the one was an older lady who was kind of rotund she was a bit chubby and <clears throat> she had an incredibly strong energy i would call her a sorceress she had an incredible incredible powerful energy the fellow that was with her was a young man who honestly seemed to be in a trance and he was walking by her side and he he had his arm up like this and he had a towel draped over his arm <clears throat> And he was walking with her like he was her assistant or something. He was human. She, I think, could have been reptilian. She walked up to me. We we met them. And, uh, you know, we said hello because we were the only people on the beach. And when she got close to me, I saw her eyes. She had bright yellow eyes with black vertical slits in them. And she smiled and she, her teeth were, her teeth were pretty green and she had fangs. She literally had fangs. And she walked up to me and we, we made eye contact and I just connected with her on a different level. What I could feel from her was this powerful energy and it was kind of secondary the fact that she may have been reptilian. But we ended up holding hands, me and this woman, this old lady, ended up holding hands and looking to, into each other's eyes on the beach. And she really looked reptilian. I really think she was reptilian. She was just in a human form, but she was a very powerful being. And my, my husband was with me and he, you know, we've talked about this before in other interviews but yeah he also saw that he totally agrees with me that she was clearly not human um but other experiences for example um my husband and hold on, I, stop 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 okay uh hold on uh before you go on to other experiences okay. uh tell us what happened on the beach with the reptilian lady what how did it end it, end, it went very well. It ended very well. Um, I was really glad to meet her, and she was very glad to meet me, and simply because of the powerful energy that she had, and I think she could feel that in me also, and we kind of connected that way. And we, we gave each other a hug and a kiss, and uh, we parted ways, and we, you know, we wished them well, and they wished us well. She did. He, he wasn't doing anything. He was, didn't speak. He was just quiet. But um, it, it ended very well. It was actually a good interaction. So did you did you ever come to understand anything more about her other, other than what you picked up on the beach about her? Did you did anything ever come up of that beyond the encounter itself? No, because I never saw her again. It was just a one-time meeting. And, uh, okay, well, know, go, on, go on with the other experience you were about to say. Don't hold back. Uh, go for that. Go for that next <laughs> Don't one. hold back. Yeah, don't okay. hold back. <laughs> well, I, I can't... Well, I think I have seen entities that probably were not human, but I... 
I don't think I've really met like my star family. I don't think I've met them physically. Hold, I don't think so. Hold on, hold, stop, stop. Okay. Okay. You're, everybody I interview, um, almost without exception, they gloss over events. They'll say, oh, this happened, and they'll jump, and they'll just forget that and go on to the next experience. So uh, the whole point of being uh, extremely interesting on any show is you got to give us the content. So you almost said something there, and you went past it. Okay. So back up, and what was it you just said about uh, oh, you said you met, you've seen some people that you are beings that you describe it again. What was okay. It? Okay. So there's another time. Okay. Okay. So I was, I was staying at a hotel and um, I met this fellow at the hotel in the hallway. And he was really tall. He was, I mean, very tall, like six and a half foot tall. And his skin was very white. And he did not have any hair. And he was wearing a suit. And I, we were both, we were both standing at a vending machine at the same time in the hallway of the hotel. And I just picked up this very strong feeling from him that he was not human. And I, I didn't want to look at him, actually. And I know that he could feel that because just kind of out of the corner of my eye, I saw him kind of smirk. Like he was getting a little bit of, of a kick out of it. But it was kind of scary. He... I don't think he was human. I think he was some type of star person. And um, I mean, his appearance alone, he, I mean, he was, he was like six and a half foot tall, may, maybe taller. But the fact that his skin was so white and he had no hair and just the energy and just his demeanor just was not human. And uh, I, I think he kind of picked that up for me. You know, he knew that I could sense that. And I I didn't speak to him. I, you know, I got my chips and my soda or whatever, and I just went back down the hallway. We didn't really talk to each other. So let's jump from aliens to the shift. Uh, you have obviously got some insight into it since you write it. Uh, okay, so... You've got uh, your books with you now? Physical copies? Yeah. Can you hold up your, uh, each one in the order in which you wrote it and what's in it? And tell us what's in it. Okay, I have to get up and just grab them off the shelf. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Take your time. Right back. <laughs> So show, show them in the order in which you wrote them. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, now I can hear you again. <laughs> show them in the order in which you wrote the star people, or back, pull it back a little bit. Down, down. Journey with the, with the star people. That's your yeah. first, right? That's my first book. And what does it focus on? Well, this is... Uh, basically book one of my spiritual journey and my experiences with the star people. This is mainly focused uh, on the star people school that happened in my early twenties and everything I've learned from them. Um, when they taught me, you know, to face my fear, psychic self-defense, energy manipulation, and then started teaching me about the shift. So that is the first well, what's book. What's your next one now? Okay. The shift. The shift. I like that color, the the blue. I guess that's blue. Thank isn't you. It? 
Yeah, I actually I actually did the artwork for both of them, and I I tried to tie the two books together. They kind of have the same blue starry backdrop. So these are the same beings. Just uh, one the one the first one is more of a is uh, a rendition, and you tried to be more realistic. <laughs> no. Second one? No. No, they're not the same beings. They're not. This is this one is like a. Um, more like one of my star family. Um, so this is a different being. This is one of the tall ones. Okay. And this guy is probably like, he's a little happy little gray. Okay. So. Uh, so this book, this yeah. book is about, this is book two of my spiritual journey with the star people. And um, this is about more about the shift now, when I started learning with the star people again, we went deeper into the energy manipulation and I was on the etheric plane with them, learning how to manifest, how to manifest things on the etheric plane and, and eventually how to manifest physically. And they taught me about the shift and they showed me the end of the world, basically. They showed me the end of this world the end of this world age that we're in right now and the process of the steps of going through the end of the world and manifesting the new world. So part of, part of the end of the world is where we have to go inward. We have to meditate and focus and go inward into our own minds and we have to release all of that programming that we've been through, all the mind control we've been through. You know, we've all been indoctrinated. If you're live on the earth plane right now, then you've been through it. So we have to let it all go. And we also have to let go of like our role in life and who we think we are and, you know, like our job and the things that we do. We have to release all of this. And I, I went through this process with the star people and when that happened, it was like a data dump. I just released everything out of my mind. And when I was done, I was still myself and everything, but it was just really like cleared out, refreshed. And this reset happens. The end of this world happens and they showed me in a number of different ways how this plays out. And I could tell you about, I could, tell you about one of them if you want um, no, I don't want to hear about one I want to hear about all of them. you don't oh you want to hear all of them okay well <laughs> all right we got eight more hours ago okay oh, yeah well I got <laughs> ten more you only got eight so we got as many hours as you and want. We did too so we've got eight more okay <laughs> okay so this happened in um it was November 11th, 2011, 2011. So that night I went out of body and I met with the star people. So I'm, so I'm in the alternate rea reality on the etheric plane with the star people. And we are on a ship and this ship is actually, interestingly, a wooden ship, like a man-made wooden ship floating on the ocean. And there are two very old star people with me. Um, there's a lady and a gentleman, and they are probably about 300 years old each. And I was at the back of the boat with the lady, and my husband, John, was also on this ship. He was at the front of the boat with the very ancient man. And so I'm sitting on the back of the boat with this ancient star person, star lady, sitting in a chair, she's sitting in a chair, and we're looking at a skyline, and we see skyscrapers and uh, in the distance, and I realize that it is New York City. And so we're sitting there looking at this, and then the boat begins to lift up out of the water. It's levitating up off of the water, floating in the air, we're going upward. And as this happens, 
I see the skyline of New York City starting to melt from the top down. The skyscrapers are starting to disappear. They're literally like melting from the top down. And what is taking their place looks like a cellular structure. Like I see these little round, just looks like what cells like it would see inside of a body, a human body. And this is what is taking the place as the, as the city is just vanishing. I see this cellular structure. And so this was the first time that they showed me basically the end of the world and the beginning of something new. So that was in 2011. And then after that. So hold on, stop. So before you go on to the next version of how it ends, um, when the replacement world, did you get any sense of what the replacement world was like in that particular scenario? In that scenario, no. All I know is that I, I think the cellular structure was kind of showing me that we're going back to basics. Like there's going to be a complete reset. Like the end of the world is really the end. It stops. And then we start from the beginning. You know, we start from the basic foundation, basic cellular structure. Go ahead, go on with your story. Next okay. one. Okay. <laughs> so, um, let's see. There were, there were two more, two more pretty big ones, significant ones that happened. And uh, these are in the book, The Shift. So on one of them, I am on the ship, I am on this ship again, on the same ship, this wooden ship, like man-made, on the same ship. It's floating in the ocean, except we are at a place that I call the top of the world. And I'm not sure if this is um, up, up where the North Pole is, to me, this is the center <clears throat> of the Earth plane, where the North Pole is, is Mount Meru. And this is the top of the world. Excuse me. So I'm on this ship. Once again, I'm sitting on the stern at the back of the ship. I'm sitting in a chair. And this time, there's someone else different sitting with me. And this is one of my classmates from the Star People School. She's another lady around my age. And we did this together. And I was aware we're going through this process of ending the world. And I was aware that there were other people on the ship with us doing it, but also other people in different places doing the same thing. And um, so what happened was me and this other girl, we each held a piece of paper in our hands and it was basically instructions on how to dismantle the world. And it was really a mental thing. And this is part of the process I was talking about where we have to let go. So I was releasing. As I was reading this paper, all of a sudden my eyes closed and they just started just twitching really fast. And as this happened, I was releasing all of the programming, the mind control, every, everything that I believed about myself, like who I am, who my role in this life is. And it was like a huge data dump, like totally clearing house, totally clearing my mind out. And this took probably like 15 minutes maybe. And then that part was over. And I, I still felt like myself. I was still myself, but I felt really refreshed and brand new. And my friend sitting next to me, she had done the same thing. And so we both, we didn't really know what was next. So we stood up and we, uh, we went over to the railing, the side of the ship. And we looked down into the ocean and, and the water had become very still. And the, the sky had become very dark, pretty much black. And the only thing I could see was 
in the distance was kind of a um, like a mesa. You know what I mean? Like a, uh, a like a flat top kind of mountain sure. in the distance and water like ocean as far as I could see. And so we both. We jumped over the side of the ship into the water and it was very shallow. It was very calm. It was basically knee deep. And we knew that this was the end. It was the end of the world. It was time for the reset. And we saw a platform. It reminds me of the Truman Show, where at the end, he sails out to the end of the world and the end of his world, and he finds a platform and he climbs the stairs. So we went to this platform that was just right there in the water. And there was a doorway and there was light coming from the doorway and we walked over to it and we heard voices coming from the doorway there wasn't anything visible it was just black but we knew if we walked through this door we would head into an area where others were waiting for us and we were going to work on the next step of creating the new world of creating the next world and that's where that experience leaves off. And then I had another very impactful experience. Um, I can't, don't quite remember which one came first. They're around the same time. But this one uh, was also showing me the end of the world. I was with the same ancient 300 year old star lady, star man. They were walking with me through a town. It was a human town. And there were only, there weren't very many people left. There were only about probably 10 people, humans, walking around. And we all gathered together and walked together and with these two ancient star people. And the houses were all opened up and empty. There, were, there was nothing in the houses. All the furniture was gone. All the, all the, all the objects, the items were all gone. Everything was cleared out. There was just houses. All the windows were open. All the doors were open. And we walked through a house. We went in the front door and walked out the back door. And it just kind of seemed to be like a psychological process we were going through. And I looked behind me, behind where we were walking from, and I could see this darkness. And it was, it's what I call the black void. And it's what happens at the end of the world when there's nothing left. There's this black void. And it's, it's not a scary thing. It's just a world that has not been manifested yet. It's just brand new. It's empty. And so we walked through this house together walked through a yard and walked through another house and we came out by the ocean once again right here on the water and there was a little a little backyard there a little patch of grass right on the water's edge and so about 10 people were standing back here with these two ancient star people and the blackness was engulfing everything it had swallowed up all of the houses and the town and everything and now it was swallowing up the grass that we were standing on and when this blackness came under our feet we could still stand it's just the the grass wasn't there anymore but we could still stand and the only thing that was left was the water and it's the same thing every time i see this kind of thing at the end of the world, there's just this black void that needs to be filled. And there, there is the ocean. And so this is what happened again. And um, it was kind of a scary experience for the humans standing there to, to watch this happen, to watch the whole world being eating, eaten up by this black void. But um, I realized that it's not a scary thing. It's really just the end of this world. And it's an unmanifested open space for us to create a new world. And so the last thing I'll, the last experience I'll say, talk about is the world of bliss. 
this, I think, is the next world. It's the next plane of existence that we go to. And this happened for me. I saw it. It was um, January 1st of 2021. And what happened was I went to sleep that night as usual. And I woke up and I was outside. And I was standing with about five people fellow classmates from the Star People School. I had been with them for a very long time. We had learned together. And we all knew. We didn't even speak to each other. We just knew what to do. And we flew straight up into the sky at an accelerated rate. And we went up through the blue sky, past the clouds. And we were going way, way up. and things started getting dark, started getting black up there where we were going. And I started to see this shiny, almost like a mirror. And it, I wasn't sure what it was at first. It looked like, um, like a shiny metal or perhaps a reflective mirror or something I was looking at. And I wondered, you know, if we were going to run into it. But the closer we got, uh, the more I realized we were looking at water. So I think what I was seeing was literally like the firmament above the earth and there is an ocean up there, it is water. And we, the five or six of us, we went right into it. And when I got into this water, I, I could look up and see that there was light coming down. And I wondered, you know, is that, is that the sun or is that a different sun? And it was shining down through the water and the water was very clear and there was no fish or sea creatures. It was just pure, clean water. And it wasn't very deep. I think maybe, maybe about a hundred foot deep. And we, we flew, flew up through this and we emerged out of this body of water into the next plane, into the next reality. And we came up out of a lake, out of the center of a lake, and we were flo flying in the air. Again, we were in, it looked like Earth. It looked like a pristine, beautiful Earth. There was, there was grass and trees and plants and flowers, and I saw, I saw a few humans there, not many. I saw a man sitting with a dog over by the side on the embankment of the lake. And in the distance, I saw some horses. And so I had come up, uh, you know, with my friends, with the human friends from the Star People School. We had come up, and I called it the world of bliss because clearly, I mean, we all knew it was an incredibly beautiful energy. And it was like a brand new, pristine earth. And this was supposed to be, you know, where we would stay. And three of my friends stayed up there and myself and one of the others we decided to go back to come back to this earth because i knew that there was an opening like a a window uh, and there was a certain uh, amount of time that we'd be able to go back up again and i thought that i had a, probably about enough time to go back and forth about five more times and I wanted to come back here to this place to help more people, to help more people raise their vibrational frequency and to wake up to who they really are, to their true spiritual selves, and to bring more people back up there with me. And so I think that that's where I'm going to be heading is the world of bliss. I think that's the next world, the next step. So, all right. So we've talked to aliens. We've talked to shift. We've talked etheric plane and aliens on Earth. And um, so who do you think controls Earth now? I think they are the fallen. I think they are fallen angels, reptilians, and demons. And I, I lump them all into one group that I call the controllers. Because they're really a, a small handful of entities uh, running the show right now. So, 
if I said the word archons, the agnostics called uh, the uh, they believed in archons. Is that the concept that you're referring to? Yes. And so, say again, you got fallen angels, demons, and reptilians, and reptilians. Mm -hmm. So, um, how do you think this thing with Putin will end? <laughs> I think Putin is, you know, just like all politicians are puppets. I think that they are controlled from the top. I think it's a show that they're putting on for us. And I think that really, um, I, I don't know. I don't know how all of that will end, but I think it's all part of a show. I think Trump will probably be um, become the president again, but I don't think he's the savior at all. I think he's probably the Antichrist. <laughs> but I think it's all a show. So, um, we've been here two hours and six minutes. And I'm sure I have a feeling you have enough experiences to go another two hours and six minutes. <laughs> I do. I don't yeah. think you want to talk that long. Uh, I have no. a feeling you have other life to live. So uh, yeah, I do. <laughs> uh, what um, is there any other experiences that you feel would enlighten the masses that you want to go through that? Maybe they're on the physical world or that would tell the people something you haven't already taught them already? Or is there anything that comes to mind that that is um, ha you haven't discussed about anything? I mean, it could be, it doesn't have to be aliens. It could be mind control. It could be um, literally anything you've learned in your existence that... <clears throat> you've gone through that you haven't focused on yet? Okay. I, I think the most important thing to, to realize is that we are eternal spiritual beings, and I will talk about my near-death experience. Great. So that happened in uh, 2010. And <clears throat> I was at home with my husband. It happened at night when I was laying in bed. And I'm not sure what happened to me, but um, I started to get very extreme hot flashes. And I don't mean like, uh, you know, like women have go through menopause. I'm talking about very severe, extreme waves of heat and cold. And my body was just kind of trembling. And I, I kept passing out and waking up. And what ended up happening was I, I was laying in the bed and I saw a bright white light with my eyes closed. And I suddenly felt like I was moving, like I was moving very fast. And <clears throat> through this white light, I think it was a tunnel of white light that I was moving through very fast. I could feel the movement. And I just stayed calm. And I came to the end of this movement and I opened my eyes. And what I saw in front of me looked like the sun. It looked like right in front of me, a orange yellow glowing disc of living energy. And it wasn't it wasn't hot. It wasn't burning my skin. It felt warm. It felt very comfortable. It felt like life energy. And I felt very good standing there. And it wasn't a huge sun, sunshine either. It was uh, probably um, maybe 20 foot in diameter disc that I was standing in front of. And I do wonder if I came through it, if it was a portal, if the white light that I went through brought me to the sun, uh, maybe right through the sun. But I was standing in front of it, looking at it, and I, oh, I mean, I was confused. I didn't know where I was, but I felt really comfortable, and I didn't care too much about moving because I loved standing there. And I realized I was standing on solid ground somehow, 
And so I started to turn my head to look to see where I was. And immediately the scene changed. And I was standing on a beach with the water behind me. The ocean was to my back. And I was looking up in a beautiful blue sky. And there was the sun up there in the sky. And I saw a hill. And on top of this hill was a castle. And I... I stood there for a minute thinking, you know, wondering where I was. And then and then it just hit me and I thought and I felt so much relief and I felt so safe and so comfortable because I knew that I was I was back home where I had come from and that I wasn't on earth anymore and I could feel the earth behind me like far far behind my left shoulder I could feel the earth and all of the problems that it that happened on earth were just like it actually made me giggle because when i was not there anymore i realized that it was just a game it was just a almost like you know a simulation or a game a temporary thing that i was taking part in and all the problems on the earth didn't really matter anymore where i was uh, because I was back home in, in the spirit world. And I felt so much relief and I was so happy to be there, uh, to be back home. And and I just thought about all the, you know, all the problems that were just ridiculous to me now. None of it mattered anymore. And I looked up at that castle and then I recognized it because it's something that I had built and partly with the star people, because when they would put me in my early 20s, they put me through this psychic testing. Sometimes they would put me through a maze, like a labyrinth, and I had to find my way out. And they would say to me, if you pass all the tests, then you will you'll get the castle. And I always wondered, you know, when am I going to get the castle? Because I passed a lot of tests and went up different levels, but I never saw the castle. But in my mind, I did think about it a lot. And that's exactly what I was looking at. I had manifested this castle in this place. And I was I was really happy about that. And I started to walk up the hill towards the castle. And while I was doing that, I could feel my family, all of my family, they were kind of in another room. And I could I could see them with my third eye. I could see them in this other room waiting for me. And it was my entire family, not just the people who had died and gone into spirit, but even the people who were still alive on the earth plane. Everyone was there. And what I, my intention was to go up into my castle and, and go into my bedroom in the castle and lie in the bed and go to sleep for a month. I just wanted to go to sleep for a month and just rest. And it's kind of interesting because as I said earlier, Four times now, people in my family have passed over, and it will always be a month before I see them. So it seems like they, they rest for a month. So that's what I intended to do. I was about halfway up to the castle, and then the scene changed again, and I was back on the beach. And I was looking. The castle was still there, and the sunshine was still there. But now I could see this mountain range that went far beyond the castle as far as I could see and there was a cliff jutting out with a unicorn a white unicorn standing on the edge of this cliff and the unicorn stretched its neck out and held its horn up to the sky and this this crack I mean it was so loud I could hear it this crack of lightning went down into the unicorn's horn she stretched her neck and it went the electricity went down into her horn, into her body, and then I realized that the unicorn was me. And I felt all of this electricity inside of my body. And the next thing I knew, I was laying in a bed, <coughs> and I was in a different place. This place was kind of dark, seemed kind of a little foggy, a little misty. And I saw a pinpoint of white light in the distance. And that was the light that was, you know, creating just a little bit of light where I was. 
And off to my side were, was a group of four or five humans, and they were quietly standing there speaking amongst themselves. And when they saw that I was awake, one of them walked up to me. This man looked like a normal human. And he uh, smiled and he leaned over my bed and he looked down at me and, and he smiled and he said, boy, somebody really pulled a star out of the sky for you. And the next thing I knew, I felt my physical body laying in the bed next to my husband and I was, it was vibrating and it was full of energy and electricity. And I started to be back in my physical body and I couldn't move. I was I was paralyzed. I was just vibrating. And I, after a few moments, I guess I was able. I said, "Help!" like that. And my husband heard me, and he he put his arms around me, and he just started rocking me gently. And and I I woke up. I came to, and my my body relaxed, and I was able to move again. And I told him what happened, and. And then I started crying because, you know, then I realized, oh, my God, I died. <laughs> and then, you know, after the whole thing, then I cried. And, and then but then I realized, you know, I, I'm not afraid to die anymore. And I know dying is just the doorway to the rest of my life, <laughs> you know, to my real life, to going back home and being my true self. And so course that was a big life changer and i know for sure that uh this world this this physical world is so interconnected with the astral and the etheric and our spiritual selves it's all connected it's all part of the same thing it's really not separate at all and so i know that this life is temporary and it will end, you know, and we will leave our physical bodies and we'll go back home and we will be our true spiritual selves again. So that's the way I feel about it. And that's probably the most important thing that I can leave people with is don't be afraid, you know, of what happens in this world because you are an eternal being and you are a powerful creator. You can manifest reality. And uh, that's what the star people taught me. And that's what that's what my husband and I practice now. We live in a beautiful place in Uruguay. And we we are literally manifesting a beautiful life for ourselves. And everybody can do it. Uh, is there anything else you want to say before we end the show? Anything? Um, else? I mean, you can promote yourself, uh, give your website, whatever um uh, things you want to do that help you manifest okay. you. what would you like to leave the people with that where they uh like for instance uh if they want to reach out to you how would they reach out to you okay they can uh reach me through my website which is alien abduction help and i also have another website with my husband John and it is called Awaken Video. So you can reach me there and um, check out my books. That would help me. That would help support me. Check out both my books. You can see them at the website Alien Abduction Help. They're also on Amazon. The Kindle versions are on Amazon. And I've got a, a t-shirt shop at awakenvideo.org, some of my own designs from that come from my experiences. And um, so, your, yeah, book so not, your book is not in print anymore. Yeah, it is. It is in print. Um, okay. Oh, yeah. through, through Lulu. Well, yes, um, but if you go to my website, Alien Abduction Help, you can buy the books there, uh, the paperback and the EPUB, and also on Amazon Kindle. You can get the Kindle version of both books. Yeah. And um, my husband and I just started doing a Friday night live stream every Friday. So if you go to awakenvideo.org, you can uh, watch us live every Friday. And I talk about these things and my experiences. And we talk about all, all kinds of things that, you know, the truth of this reality that everybody really needs to know. 
Uh, okay, it sounds like you've finished. Uh, anything else, any last thing you want to say before I end the show? Keep loving your heart, everybody. Keep loving your heart and never be afraid ever. This is my motto. Never be afraid ever. Cool. Uh, it's been a pleasure having yeah, you on the show. Yeah, it's been great. <laughs> um, if you ever want to come back and talk about um, maybe more alien experiences on this realm. Okay. Uh, uh, physical realm, we can always do that again. And let me go ahead and stop the show. Okay, thanks, Mike. Thank you very much for being on the show. You're uh, welcome. Uh, give me your full name again. Bonnie Jean, Jean Mitchell. Mitchell. All right. Bonnie Jean Mitchell. Thank you for being on my show, Bonnie Jean Mitchell. Nice it's to meet pleasure. you. It really has been a pleasure. And thank you. Tell your husband I said he's a very lucky man. Thank you, Charles Michael Beaver. I love your name because I love beavers. <laughs> <laughs> there we go.